Blessed be the one holy and living God. Glory to God forever and ever. Amen. I will go to the altar of God. To the God of my joy and gladness. Give judgment for me, O God, and defend my cause against an ungodly people. Deliver me from the deceitful and the wicked. For you are the God of my strength. Why have you put me from you? And why do I go so heavily while the enemy oppresses me? Send out your light and your truth that they may lead me and bring me to your holy hill and to your dwelling. That I may go to the altar of God, to the God of my joy and gladness. And on the harp I will give thanks to you, God, O oh my God. Why are you so full of heaviness, O my soul? And why are you so disquieted within me? Put your trust in God, for I will yet give thanks to the Holy One, who is the help of my countenance and my God. Glory to God, source of all being, incarnate Word and Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. I will go to the altar of God, to the God of my joy and gladness. Almighty God, to you, to you all hearts are open, all, all desires desire known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. May God be with you and also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, who by whose providence your servant John the Baptist was wonderfully born and sent to prepare the way of your Son, our Savior, by preaching repentance. Make us so to follow his teaching and holy life that we may truly repent according to his teaching and following his example, constantly speak the truth, boldly rebuke vice, and patiently suffer for the truth's sake. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Holy Gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord Christ. The time came for Elizabeth to give birth, and she bore a son. Her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown his great mercy to her, and they rejoiced with her. On the eighth day they came to circumcise the child, and they were going to name him Zechariah after his father. But his mother said, No, he is to be called John. They said to her, None of your relatives has this name. Then they began motioning to his father to find out what name he wanted to give him. He asked for a writing tablet and wrote, His name is John. And all of them were amazed. Immediately his mouth was opened and his tongue freed. And he began to speak, praising God. Fear came over all of their neighbors and all those things were talked about throughout the entire hill country of Judea. All who heard them pondered them and said, what then will this child become? For indeed, the hand of the Lord was with him. Then his father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke this prophecy. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has looked favorably on his people and redeemed them. He has raised up a mighty savior for us in the house of his servant David, as he spoke through the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, that we would be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. Thus he has shown the mercy promised to our ancestors and has remembered his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our ancestor Abraham to grant us that we, being rescued from the hands of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people, by the forgiveness of their sins. By the tender mercy of our God, the dawn from on high will break upon us to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. The child grew and became strong in spirit, and he was in the wilderness until the day he appeared publicly to Israel. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. 
Well, tonight uh, is a red letter night for any of you who are trying to catch me in something. Uh, all of a sudden, as I was, we're processing in, I realized uh, today, of course, is the feast of the nativity of St. John the Baptist, and I forgot, I forgot, I forgot to change out our vestments, the, the colors. It's supposed to be white tonight. Now we're wearing green. So you got me. This is a good thing. So you can hold this against me for a long time. Oh, I will. I know you guys will. You definitely will. <laughs> well, tonight, as I said, is the Feast of St. John the Baptist. It is uh, the, the nativity of the Feast, uh, the Feast of the Nativity of St. John the Baptist. So we're going to hear a little bit about St. John the Baptist. He's an interesting character, a formidable character. I preach about him on a regular basis because he's, he's different. He's a different kind of person. I'm going to read a little bit from Robert Ellsberg on it. But then we're going to hear about, about him from our good friend, um, Father John Julian. Father John Julian always has a very different take, a, a flip, a, a, a different perspective on everything. And so we're going to hear this very nice uh, meditation on John the Baptist from Ellsberg. And then we're going to hear something completely different from Father John Julian. It's nights like this that I wish Tom Rubio was here. Tom, I, I miss Tom's... Uh, rolling of his eyes and his frustration sometimes with some of the weird stories I share. But you know what? Tonight, no holes barred as far as I'm concerned. We're going to be hearing some weird stories about John the Baptist. So first of all, let's start out with a nice little meditation on John the Baptist from Ellsberg. Uh, the quote, of course, comes from John the Baptist himself. I am the voice of the one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord. One of the most certain facts about the life of Jesus is that his public ministry was linked initially with the ministry of John the Baptist. St. Luke's claimed, St. Luke claims that they were related, their mothers being cousins. The other evangelists, however, are silent on this matter. Instead, they present John in somewhat mysterious terms as a kind of reprise of Elijah and the Hebrew prophets of old. Now, he kind of glazed over that if you notice. He kind of glazed a reprise of Elijah. That's not really what the scriptures say. The scriptures make it a little more emphatic that he's not just some, some character who's like Elijah. It's emphatic in scripture, which in, in which it states he really is the second coming of Elijah. Now, this brings up a very interesting thing. Again, I wish Tom was here for this particular part of my homily this evening. This opens up a very interesting discussion on reincarnation. Was John the Baptist the reincarnation of Elijah? Now, we say that because we have a very, a very distinct view in our personal modern Western society of what reincarnation is. We think reincarnation is sort of this kind of Hindu, Indian, New Agey kind of understanding that someone dies, they're reborn again, and uh, you know, there's no real memory of who they were before, and it's this unending cycle. That's not what scripture is saying about reincarnation. Reincarnation means what? Incarnation means in the flesh. Reincarnation means you come back into the flesh. Eucharist is also a type of reincarnation to a large extent. It is Jesus comes back and is incarnated into into our, our, the bread and wine of the Eucharist. Each time, it's a reincarnation of Jesus. So, Elijah being the reincarnation, or uh, uh, John the Baptist being the reincarnation of Elijah, seems kind of weird, but then when we start really thinking about it, you know what, it could be. And it's fascinating just to explore that and to see what that is. And, and certainly, if nothing else, just symbolically to say that like Elijah, he was foretelling the Messiah coming because Elijah did that. Um, here, here comes Jesus. So we can, we can leave it, if, if nothing else, along those lines. Uh, I would be so fascinated to hear what Tom would say about that particular conversation. But anyway, there we go on that. Uh, living in the wilderness, clothed in camel skins, while dining on wild honey and locusts, John seemed to emerge out of nowhere, warning Israel of a coming judgment and performing baptisms in the, in the Jordan River for the forgiveness of sins. Jesus himself, according to all four Gospels, was among those who appeared among the penitents, seeking baptism at John's hands. Sin and the general need for conversion were evidently John's principal themes. By sin, however, John was not so much concerned with ritual purity 
or the observance of the law, the whole people stood under judgment and all were summoned to conversion. But he seems to have directed special scorn to those members of the privileged social and religious classes whom he called a brood of vipers. His call to conversion had a distinctly social dimension. He who has two coats, let him share one with, with one, let him share with one who has none. And he who has food, let him do likewise. Baptism was not enough. It was necessary to bear fruit that befits repentance, beginning with the practice of justice and mercy. John did not spare the ruler of Galilee, uh, Herod Antipas, from, the, from his sharp criticism. This Herod, like his father Herod the Great, was a brutal man who might have earned John's criticism for any number of reasons. The evangelists, however, single out the fact that Herod had divorced his first wife in order to marry the wife of his half-brother Herodias. Uh, apparently, John rebuked Herod to his face. Herod responded by having him arrested and ultimately beheaded. The, the Jewish historian Josephus suggests that Herod was principally concerned that John's preaching was likely to inspire a popular uprising. In any case, this was the man with whom Jesus chose to be linked. And yet, in his message and in his style of living, Jesus differed notably from John. Jesus was so far from being a fasting ascetic that he was accused of being a drunkard and a glutton. There was a spirit of joyfulness among the disciples of Jesus, a group that included some of John's former disciples, that contrasted with the penitential atmosphere surrounding the Baptist. And while John's principal theme was the anger of God, typically he employed such images as the axe at the roots, the winnowing fork, and the unquenchable fire, John preferred to speak, or Jesus preferred to speak of God's mercy. But it appears that for both John and Jesus, the encounter of the, uh, at, the, at the Jordan marked a significant transition. Shortly afterward, John was arrested, and Jesus began to preach the coming of the kingdom of God. From his prison cell, John sent a message to Jesus, asking, are, ye, are you he who is to come, or shall we look for another? To this, Jesus replied, go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk, Lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up, and the poor have good news preached to them. And blessed is he who takes no offense at me. According to the fourth gospel, Jesus, uh, John went to his death a happy man. As for Jesus, who could not fail to see in John's fate a foretelling of his own, he offered his, this epitaph for his cousin. I tell you, among those born of women, none is greater than John. Yet, who is, yet he who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. It's a wonderful story. He's a wonderful, very important saint. So that was a beautiful, kind of warm uh, meditation on John the Baptist. And then we're going to hear from John Julian, who's going to give us a very different take on who uh, John the Baptist was. And he begins his little story on John the Baptist this way. You're going to like this, John. He's kind of your patron saint, too, John the Baptist, yes. John the Baptist might well be seen as the patron saint of hippies. Oh, that's, that's Father John Julian for you. Living up in the wilderness uh, of the desert, dressed only in the skin of a camel, with long hair that was never cut, living off the land by eating only locusts and wild honey, railing against the hypocrisy of the establishment, and confronting even the king himself face to face for his immorality. However, the similarity becomes less obvious when we realize that John was almost, almost, almost certainly a vowed Nazarite. Now, a Nazarite, of course, for any of you who might be interested in this, in the, in the Hebrew scriptures, a Nazarite was essentially a, a man who vowed himself so completely to God that he refused to touch alcohol, he refused to touch women, he couldn't cut his hair. Uh, what, 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 Bible, what book of the Bible is that? Samuel. Samuel. And, uh, and Nazareth, in that sense, was sort of like a monk to some extent, but monks at least cut their hair. And so for John Julian to make this comparison to John the Baptist being a Nazareth is very, very interesting and probably very apt. He also goes on to say he was probably also a virgin, had never touched a drop of wine or strong drink, 
and finally was willing for his own disciples to leave him and for himself to be supplanted and replaced by Jesus. That is a very, very, as crazy as what he was saying there to some extent, that's it. That is John the Baptist perfectly. That captures him in a nutshell. Um, in almost every case, the church celebrates her saints on the day of their deaths or the transition of their relics. For only three is the Feast of the Nativity kept. Of course, for Jesus himself, for his mother Mary, where we celebrate her, the nativity of her birth on September 8th, and, of course, for St. John the Baptist, which is today. And this feast is one of the very oldest in the church calendar. It was old and well-established on this date by the time St. Augustine wrote about it in the 4th century. Now, John Julian loves to tell legends, and there is a great legend about John, uh, about St. John uh, the Baptist that he tells here, and this is pretty interesting. There is a charming lesson based, uh, legend based on the fact that this same day is also the traditional day of the death of St. John the Apostle, who could also be your other patron saint. It is said that there, they, uh, that there were two doctors of theology who were arguing about which of the St. Johns was the greater of the saints. Um, and so they, they argued back and forth. One favored the Baptist and the other favored the Apostle. They prepared a formal debate gathered all the authorities and arguments that they could to support their own claims, when, on the day of disputation, each saint appeared in a vision to each of his champions, and said this, We two get along very well together in heaven. Don't start disputes about us here on earth. I love that. That's a great story. And so it was settled that since ba the Baptist was the elder, he was assigned this date, and the apostle was given the third day after Christmas. I love that. I hope that's a true story. That would be a really great story. Um, it is interesting that in all of these things, well, of course, the Gospel reading for today talks about this miraculous birth of St. John the Baptist, and, and it was a, a, a pretty amazing birth in and of itself. I think if Jesus had not come along, a lot of people probably would have thought that John the Baptist himself was the Messiah to some extent, which would have probably drove poor John the Baptist completely nuts. Um, it is strongly uh, believed by many scholars that at least part of John's life in the desert was almost certainly spent with the Jewish Essene community at Qumran, uh, where he had picked up some of his ideas about repentance and the coming of the Messiah. Now, Qumran is important because Qumran was also where the Dead Sea Scrolls came from, so from that community. So there's some, they believe there's some connection between the Dead Sea Scrolls and the community that put those Dead Sea Scrolls together, and John the Baptist. John's austere and celibate life as a desert-dwelling Nazarite was, uh, was very rare and unusual in the Jewish culture of his day, but it has made him a favorite with monastics over the century who have get, seen him as a type of the ascetic monk, and there are many religious orders named for him or who have them to have him as their patron. In Eastern Byzantium, which of course was the Eastern Orthodox Church, John is sometimes pictured with wings, based on uh, Mark chapter 1, verse 2. I am sending my herald, or angelos in Greek, ahead of you. He will prepare your way. A curious additional note about John the Baptist is that in about 770, Paul the deacon, a Benedictine monk of Monte Cassino in Italy, was to sing the blessing of the Paschal Canon. Now, our own Deacon John will be uh, doing that next Easter Vigil. You'll be doing this, uh, uh, this uh, chanting for the Paschal Candle, and there's a whole special thing in there. Well, he was about to do this, but found that his throat was suddenly too hoarse to sing. In order that his voice might be restored, he composed a prayer to St. John the Baptist in hymn form. And this is what he said. That with untroubled voice your servants may sing the wonders of your deeds, Cleanse the sins of our unhealthy uh, of our unclean lips, O Holy John. In the 11th century, Guido of Dorenzo recognized that the music to this hymn started on the note C, with each line a scale degree higher than the last. So he used the first syllable of each line of the hymn to label the di diatonic scale of C major. And I'm gonna I'm gonna mess this up. Ut, re, mi, fa, so, la, sa, sa. Okay, I don't know. 
I'm not a musician, so if you're a musician, you know, I've just really messed that up. Anyway, eventually I, is it Ut? U-T? I play by ear. Okay, well, there you go. <laughs> Was replaced with Do. Oh. We know Do because we all know the sound of music. Okay. Except in France. And Sa became C and later T. Uh, reproducing the familiar scale. Do, Re, Mi, Fa, Sol, La, Ti, Do. We know that because of sound of music. So, yes, exactly. <laughs> so John the Baptist inadvertently is kind of responsible for that. So I, I love that. That's kind of interesting. There's also an early uh, rural lyric in England relating to the Midsummer Feast. Midsummer rain spoils hay and grain. Cut all your thistles before St. John, or soon will be two instead of one. But with all the great praise that has been heaped on St. John the Baptist, perhaps the most telling and poignant are the simple 11 words from the beginning of the Gospel of John. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. Uh, I love all of that, and it is an important feast, if for no other reason, this is the traditional mid midsummer feast. This is it. This is when they would do the, uh, the Maypole, and they would do all of that. If you ever want to see an interesting film, I know I do this all the time, there's an interesting film out there called Midsummer. Uh, it's a horror film. It's from it's uh, it's about pagans in Sweden. Uh, watch it. It's a very disturbing film. But it's all about this particular feast. So, um, and if you hate it, don't blame me for it. So, um, it's. Well, I had I had my atheist best friend Greg watch it, and he said that was the worst movie he's ever seen in his life. So, uh, it's it's disturbing. But anyway. Uh, this this is an important feast, and I, I, I'm very grateful for St. John the Baptist. I love exploring these different layers of his life, and, and even ex trying to explore this whole thing of the reincarnation, if, that's a, if that is a part of our tradition. Uh, I, I just think it's very interesting to see his connections with the prophet uh, Elijah and all of that, so I think that's very, very interesting. We're going to close tonight with a prayer for uh, St. John the Baptist, so let us pray. God of our salvation, accept all we offer you this day and free us to worship you without fear in holiness and righteousness of life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us now stand and profess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator, creator of heaven and earth. I believe, I believe in Jesus Christ, Christ God's, God's only Son, Son, our Lord. He, he was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He, he suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us offer prayers to our loving and all-accepting God, saying, Hear our prayer. Hear, Hear our, our prayer. prayer. For the church, for this holy gathering, for St. Stephen's, and for the people of God in every place, holy God, hear our prayer. For an outpouring of your Holy Spirit upon us and upon this congregation, that we may grow in holiness and vitality, holy God, hear our prayer. For all of us who follow Jesus our Savior, striving in our own ways to love God and love each other as equals, holy God, hear our prayer. For all peoples and their leaders, for our nation and its leaders, and for us during this time of upheaval and division, and we pray for justice, mercy, and peace in the world. Holy God, hear our prayer. For the victims of racism, violence, and any form of discrimination, that justice and equality may prevail. Holy God, hear our prayer. For all who are affected by the coronavirus, that they may find relief, healing, and recovery. Holy God, hear our prayer. For all of those who are suffering, for those who are dying, and for all those in need of our prayer this evening. Tonight we pray for Darla, Charlotte, Josh, Jennifer, Tom, 
Brian, Michael, Janine, and Jim. Holy God, hear our prayer. For those who are in special need, tonight we pray for Patsy Larson, Helga, and Brian. Holy God, hear our prayer. For our own prayers, repeat it either silently or aloud. I invite you now to share those. Holy God, hear our prayer. For those who have died in Christ and for all of the departed, especially Jim Coffey, Jason Gould, Alan Larson, John Neamey, and Sister Thomas Weller. Say the name again. Weller. Holy God, hear our prayer. Lifting our voices with the Blessed Virgin Mary, Stephen the Martyr, and all creation, let us offer ourselves and one another to you, the living God. Through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, Holy God, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Almighty and eternal God, ruler of all things in heaven and earth, mercifully accept the prayers of your people and strengthen us to do your will. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and one another. God of all mercy, we confess that we have sinned against you, opposing your will in our lives. We have denied your goodness in each other, in ourselves, and in the world you have created. We repent of the evil that enslaves us, the evil we have done, and the evil done on our behalf. Forgive, restore, and strengthen us through our Savior Jesus Christ, that we may abide in your love and serve only your will. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Please be seated. Uh, um, let's see. Well, first of all, I should do the peace of the Lord be always with you. That should be the peace answer. with you. <laughs> peace to all of you. Uh, just a few announcements before we continue with our service. And first and foremost, of course, uh, what mass is this? Is it your third or fourth mass? This is, if you include the one I did with the bishop. We do include that. Fourth mass. Fourth mass. Well, very good. Yes. It's good to have you here, John. It is, uh, normally we have Matt Patno playing some saxophone. We miss him tonight. It was a little different tonight not having him here. Especially since you had all those music theory questions. I know it would have been perfect <laughs> had he been here. But, oh well, we miss him tonight. So uh, hopefully he'll be back next week. And uh, so that is that. Uh, as you, most of you know, uh, Jim Coffey, of course, passed away on Monday. We do ask you to keep the, uh, keep the repose of his soul in your prayers at this time. Be praying for his wife, Joy, and their entire family right now during this time. Just to give you a little update, uh, so most of you got the email, but I think there was some question about uh, the services that will be coming up for him. There is a visitation tomorrow evening from 5 to 7 at Hanson Runswold that is open to the public, so feel free to come. There is a prayer service at 7. I'll be leading that prayer service. There will be a time for people to share memories at that time. So if you have some memories of, of Jim, come to that service and, and share those memories at that time. So it will be a really beautiful service tomorrow at 7 at Hanson Runswold. There will be a uh, private memorial service for the family at, uh, here at St. Stephen's, of course, on Saturday morning at 11 o'clock. We will live stream that. So uh, only family in the church, but you can watch it through live stream. And the, uh, the, the uh, prayer service on Thursday will be live streamed through the Hanson Runswold website. So that would be very, very nice. So uh, there we are. Uh, also interesting, next Wednesday when you join us, we will be doing a Requiem Mass next Wednesday because we have another unclaimed urn. One of the funeral homes in town had an unclaimed urn, so we will be bearing that unclaimed urn in our memorial garden after, after Mass next Wednesday night. So we'll be doing a Requiem Mass. The man's name was John Nimi. He died in 2009. So his, uh, his sister lived elsewhere and she just uh, didn't claim his ashes. They've been sitting there for 11 years. So finally, one of the funeral homes said, we'd love to give them a place to rest. Our memorial garden is the place. So we will be doing that next week. So it will be good to welcome John Mimi into our family in some way. So 
that is that, I think, for our announcements. I can't imagine anything else. Can you think of anything else that's going on? I think it's pretty quiet for the most part. Well, it's not quiet. I don't know why I'm saying it's quiet. It's actually a very, very busy <laughs> time right now. But I mean, comparatively so, it's, it's, it's what it is. Uh, so, walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself as an offering and sacrifice to God. And I, that was John's line. And I right. apologize for taking that from John. No problem. <laughs> Old habits die hard. <laughs> Old habits do. And I'm doing your job again. <laughs> Jeez <laughs> Louise. Blessed are you, O God of all creation. Through your goodness we have this bread to offer, which the earth has given and human hands have made. Become for us the bread of life. Blessed be God forever. Blessed are you, O God of all creation. Through your goodness we have this wine to offer, the fruit of the vine and work of human hands. Become for us the cup of salvation. Blessed be God forever. Come, Almighty God, our sanctifier, and bless this sacrifice now made ready for your holy name. Amen. The Lord be with you. also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. It is truly right and good and joyful to give you thanks, our holy God, source of life and fountain of mercy. You have filled us in all creation with your blessing and fed us with your constant love. You have redeemed us in Jesus Christ and knit us into one body. Through your spirit to replenish us and call us to fullness of life. Therefore, joining with angels and archangels and with the faithful of every generation, we lift our voices with all creation as we say, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, 
God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed are you, gracious God, creator of the universe and giver of life. Recalling your great goodness to us in Jesus, we celebrate our redemption with this bread of life and this cup of salvation. Send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts of bread and wine, that they may be for us the body and blood of Jesus our Savior. On the night before he died for us, Jesus was at table with his friends. He took bread, gave thanks to you, broke it, and gave it to them, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, Jesus took the cup of wine. Again, he gave thanks to you, gave it to them, and said, Drink this, all of you. This is the blood of this is the blood, my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Grant that we who share these gifts may be filled with the Holy Spirit and live as Christ's body in the world. Bring us into the everlasting heritage of your daughters and sons, that with all your saints, past, present, and yet to come, we may praise your name forever. Through Christ, and with Christ, and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, to you be honor, glory, and praise forever and ever. Amen. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we now pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, grant us peace. This is the Lamb of God, this is the one who takes away the sins of the world. Happy are we who are called to this supper. And at this point, let us pray for all those who cannot receive Holy Communion at this time. Lord Jesus, be present with those who long to be here and receive your Holy Presence in this Eucharist. Come spiritually into their hearts and let them know your healing, loving, and life-giving presence, and never let them be separated from you. Amen. Let us pray. God of abundance, you have fed us with the bread of life and the cup of salvation. You have united us with Christ and one another, and you have made us one with all your people in heaven and on earth. Now send us forth in the power of your Spirit, that we may proclaim your redeeming love to the world. 
and continue forever in the risen life of Christ our Savior. Amen. Now may the peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of God's only Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you now and always. Amen. Go forth in the name of Christ. Thanks be to God.